Greetings, dear listeners, and welcome once again to Redemption <laughs> Meditations. I'm Lee, as always, joined by Steve and Dana. Hello, gentlemen. Hello, Lee. Hello, how Steve. Doing, Lee? Hi, Dana. I don't care how you're doing, so I'm not going to ask. What I do care about <laughs> is today's topic. <laughs> Did, Dana, didn't you just say in the sermon, I think it was last week, about like we we ask each other how we're doing, but we don't actually really mean a proper answer? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you say it's true. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I don't Great. I don't I don't actually want an answer to that. That's just a way of saying hi. I am internally falling apart, but thanks for asking. Yeah. No, no, I'm doing I don't great. Care. Yeah, I'm doing great. Yes. Fine, as I weep enormous salty tears, right? That's right. Well, I am I am intrigued and interested in our uh, topic for today. So I would like to uh, just maybe put the first question out there. Um, it's become a bit of a of a timeless issue, I, it would seem at this point, and something that we we need good answers to. So, um, first of all. What is a marriage? Marriage is a God ordained um, union um, between a man and a woman for life, and that and they so it's a union, uh, a, a intermingling of their whole entire life, um, not just a not just a close friendship. It's not just a business arrangement. Um, or a contract or anything like that. It's actually a covenant union. Um, and so typically, uh, historically, at least for the last several hundred years, um, um, American churches have followed the, it's actually from the uh, the Book of Common Prayer, the the vows, the order mm -hmm. of, a, of a service is typically from the Book of Common Prayer. And so they make vows to one another, um, you know, to have and to hold from this day forth and, and all of that. And um, so we believe that it is in the sight of God, um, that God ordained it from the beginning, from before sin entered into the world, God created Adam and Eve. Um, and, and it, when he created Eve at the end of chapter one of Genesis, um, uh, the two will become one flesh. Um, uh, Jesus referring back to that later says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Um, yeah, so, so the marriage, marriage is a covenant agreement between a man and a woman for a lifetime, um, with certain b benefits and privileges. Yeah. I and in the context, know. let me just add one thing, sorry. And in the context no. of it, um, particularly in Genesis chapter one, the context of the creation of marriage is also for, uh, procreation. Go ahead, yeah, it's, Sorry, it's, a blessing it's from one the Lord, of the right? it, it, it's the mm -hmm. first institution uh given to humanity by god and it's the foundation stone uh, upon which family as god intends it to be leading to that's just what i was about to get into uh being fruitful and multiplying uh that, that that's we, we start with uh marriage and uh, it, it's it's also worth noting, and, and it's almost like God knew what he was doing here, that this is one of the foundational building blocks for an ordered, civilized society. If you yes. take that away, lots of other stuff that isn't directly involved crumbles fast. Yeah. And I think that's why it, all, all the attempts to um nuke the nuclear family uh have failed or or produced uh incredibly damaged people um i looked into the confession so chapter 25 of the 1689 confession is of marriage and you know obviously so this is a you know this is a 17th century document um but they do you know they they address you know particular issues that are really important um and Granted, they, it might not exactly touch some of the issues that we might touch today uh, because, you know, modern times sometimes produce modern sins, it seems like. But uh, but speaking of – so paragraph one, marriage to be between one man and one woman. 
Uh, neither is it lawful for any man to have more than one wife or any woman uh, to have any more than one husband at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. Crucial. Uh, polygamy uh, was a, certainly an issue then. It's an issue now in certain in certain places. It's always good to remember that. Um, I it really I think paragraph two was really nice. Uh, marriage was ordained for the mutual help of husband and wife. Super important. Um, mutual help for the increase of mankind with a legitimate issue. Danny, you just touched on that. You know, producing children, children who know their father and their mother, uh, and for the preventing of uncleanness, which I think is also. And interesting. What uh, Dana, you had the modern language one out. What does what phrase does that use for that? Prevention of immorality. Prevention of immorality. Very yep. interesting. Okay. I yep. now that that's a phrase I want to I want to come back to. But since we're giving definitions here, what would you venture as a definition of a wedding? So we've talked about marriage. What what is a wedding then? Well, weddings are very cultural. Um, different cultures have different ceremonies. There's, biblically speaking, there's there's some kind of ceremony. Um, uh, by the time you get so the wedding at Cana, for example, is the probably one of the most famous weddings in, in Scripture. Although there's a few, um, the, there's a party, there's a celebration that is happening. Like a week long a party. party. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it was a very long. It was a, an extensive party, but much actually much more extensive. The weddings that we have today have gotten to be very, you know, these massive events, but they're really just still doing one day. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but in the New Testament, I mean, it was, these were these long um, uh, community-wide often celebrations. And, and they were seen uh, typically as families coming together. That goes back even into the Old Testament where you have some, you um, arranged marriages or at least uh you know like like i think of um isaac so abraham sends uh the servant off to find you know a wife a, a specific wife of a specific tribe um and he he basically makes a deal and brings her back and um so so there's as far as a wedding itself there's not a lot of um detail in scripture as to what the wedding is supposed to look like because it's a covenant that's why from a christian wedding we've taken that covenant language of the vows i will do this and i will you know the other person says i will do this and we've applied that to a, a christian marriage and um and and i i believe that in a christian marriage it ought to be um in front of the church um, I, I, I've said before that it should be in the church. I'm, I'm not as, um, hard and fat. Like I, I get it. I, you know, our own kids, one of them was at a farm on outside and, um, space wise, we kind of had to do that. Uh, so I'm not like hard and fast on that, but, but there's an element of it, of the church being the witnesses, the church and family. Um, but in the old Testament, the, the, um, in fact, whatever the uh, ce wedding ceremony looked like, um, often what is emphasized is either the reception after, or um, the consummation of the of the marriage union, which is a little strange to think about. But but that's what's emphasized in the Bible. So as far as the a wedding goes they they kind of can be cultural right like a wedding ring when we do the exchange of the rings um sometimes we t we talk about the symbolism of a ring and you know i think I, I, it's sort of like for me this is maybe a tangent for me it's almost like the symbolism of a candy cane you ever see those oh, things yeah <laughs> that's fine i don't i don't care but it's a it's nice just story a candy cane. Yeah, it's a nice story. It's a candy cane. The ring, like people are wearing rings to say that it's therefore, you know, Christians are really the only ones who can wear, you know what I mean? Like to pull mm -hmm. it out, whatever. But I understand the symbolism of it. Yeah. And I wear a wedding ring, you know, I have for years now, many years. I don't even know how many years. <laughs> Uh-oh. 28. <laughs> but you've cherished every day. <laughs> right. This <laughs> seemed like just, just a moment. Right. See, every day being better than the next <laughs> makes all the years blur together, right? That's right. Yeah. N nice spin, Lee. There we go. 
from the single guy. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say maybe I'll use that one someday. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things that's important to note is the the idea that weddings, and I'm thinking especially about in the Western world, and even maybe even more specifically Christian weddings, is, is that you do have witnesses. There is this idea yeah. that society has an interest in what's going on here yeah you have two people who are pretty involved in in the ceremony who the 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 bride and the groom of course but they're not only are they covenanting to each other and with god and, and we would and that would be an important thing to note as our yep. con conversation continues here but there's also normally a lot of witnesses or maybe in some cases at least a few because the society in the world has an interest for the well-being of that society that this sort of thing takes place. It's not just these two people just went out there and did it all by themselves. It doesn't have any effect on anybody else in any way. That's really not true. And if we if it is that, then you're getting out of what we might think of as marriage now. It's It's getting into some other weird thing. And we would have to decipher that depending on what's going on there. But when we think of marriage, it's a it's a bigger deal than just this couple. So with this particular issue, we have kind of a collision of something that's outside of culture, right? That the marriage covenant that's instituted by God from the beginning. Um, and then we have the the then coming in with cultural particularities around that covenant um especially in the way that we celebrate the making of that covenant um and i guess i use the word celebrate because that's i think at least culturally here in the u.s that's typically what a wedding is about is celebrating the this union of man and woman and their friends and family coming together not only to witness but but to celebrate the fact that th they have made this covenant together, um, I I don't see, I don't see a way. I think regardless of of the culture in which a wedding occurs, I don't see a way that you could avoid celebration being part of it. Yeah, I think it's that's intrinsic to what a wedding is and and what weddings are are doing, but the purpose of them, I guess. Um, the yeah, they're ultimately they're creating an, a new family, mm -hmm. yeah, a new a new husband and wife unit that will create you know that will that will um, you know God willing will have their own children and will start a whole new family. It'll be a blending of these two families together, but it's a whole new thing. And so it's it, in some ways to sort of um, cheapen it a little bit, maybe in, in some ways it's like a graduation, right? So it it is sort of the ultimate mark of adulthood mm. um you know you are you, we are saying so we the witnesses we the the parents of both involved I'm, I'm thinking it's like the the father giving away the bride um like all of that is is and the, and the minister presiding over it is all saying you know you something fundamentally is changing here today you are adults, you are grown up, like you are fully, um, I don't know, you've graduated from childhood, you are now, you know, and, and sometimes that happens later in life. So I, that's why I don't want to like, yeah, make the analogy to graduation too, too closely there. But, but there is this something fundamental is changing here today, where a new uh, non pre existing condition is is you know, in, in these two people are coming together to make a new family in the sight of God. And, um, and, and so there's, there's something just fundamentally changing in the, in their lives and therefore in, you know, their own family, in their parents' lives and their sibling, you know, all those around them, something fundamental changes when that union is made. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things that's interesting about, uh, the, the, the vow taking and the witnesses is one of the reasons why you're there is if you start to think maybe this wasn't such a good idea after you took the vow, there are people there who are going to hold you to your vow because I heard you. 
yeah. right? You right. you made a vow to the to the girl or the boy a, a, and to God right. in front of me. And you don't get to just say, wow, this is like harder than I thought. I don't think I want to do that. Well, that's not how <laughs> vows work. And buddy, you said you were going to do this. So like you need to do it even if it is hard. And, and I think yeah. the, the other thought I had, Lee, that you mentioned, which I think is important, is that this is a celebration. So you are the, the event itself is affirming what's happening. It, it, as a matter of fact, traditionally, part of the ceremony is if somebody thinks we shouldn't be celebrating this, you better speak up right now because we're about to do this. Mm -hmm. That's that's such a, an yeah. interesting, you know, that, that you bring that up, Steve, is so important because we don't we don't do that anymore. Like I haven't done it in our in our weddings, partially because I don't want anybody speaking up. Right? right. Yeah, <laughs> it could get awkward real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but but there there's an element to that of like you're right, like so so and and to tie that to, um, and, and I, I probably should be careful about this, but. I don't think I need to be too careful. People who get their ordination online or their license to be able to perform a wedding online and aren't really any kind of spiritual authority, like that's not what a wedding is supposed to be. And, and I'm thinking, especially for, for unbelievers, it's kind of a whole different thing, right? They don't. And, and I, I wish that it was the same for unbelievers, but I'm, I'm kind of like, that's not their biggest problem. Um, but for believers, uh, if you're if 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 you're a believer, right? So boyfriend, girlfriend, fiancés, if they're believers, they should have a God ordained spiritual authority. So their pastor perform their wedding because right. because of partially because of what you just said, Steve, about um, we're going to hold you accountable. So many of the church discipline issues in our society are because of marriage problems, right? Either adultery or abandonment or, or abuse or something like that. And, and so to, to make your vows with your pastor standing there with a, with a, or an elder, with a representative of the, of the, the God ordained um, uh, leadership of your church, you know, you're, you're making vows in his sight my job as a pastor is to shepherd those people and and um uh make sure and and this is interpreted in different ways but make sure that you're holding up your end of the bargain right or your your vow is more than your end of the bargain you're you're part of the covenant so that when a when a wife comes um that i've done the marriage for when a wife comes and says we're really having problems he's doing these things i can i have the authority to they've submitted to that authority already not only as they're you know hopefully they're church members and they've they've come under the authority of the of the church and of the the elders but even in the wedding right in your marriage um you've already given me the authority to to say you can't do that Right. Or you have to do this and, you know, whatever to confront sin. Now, I think that's an important point that we sometimes miss because we want, you know, and to, to go on just a little bit more. I actually think it should be. So sometimes, um, you know, people will get married that are that go to different churches, right, different towns or something. And um, there's a sentimentality of the bride wants, you know, her childhood pastor to marry her or something like that. But they're going to go live in, you know. San Diego or something. Um, <laughs> Ew. I <laughs> I get it, but there's also um, your your pastor, like your current pastor, should be the one doing this because he's the one that's going to see it and and be able to speak into those things. He's going to be the one who, who you're going to ask for help. Um, you know, two years from now or five years from now or whatever. Yeah, I would go the, I, I would also include in that sort of going back the other way and you're talking about the future, but if, if things go how I think all three of us would say they ought to, that pastor should have been meeting with these people regularly yeah. and right. with some pretty extensive conversations. And now by the fact that we're having a wedding ceremony at all, that pastor is giving his 
glad endorsement to this union. Right. But like he, he's by the fact that we're here, he's saying I'm not worried that oh man, he's going to be abusive to her or she's going to cheat. I just know like there's no doubt in my mind this is going to go bad. Well then yeah. we shouldn't be here. Like right. we should never have gotten to this point. And the fact that we are here means a, a, an endorsement by hopefully the a guy who knows them well enough that he would be able to say, yeah, we have a problem here. We can't yep. move forward. Yeah. Um, there's a, a subtext here that I kind of want to bring out and I think it's going to branch into um, another, uh, another issue that we should speak about regarding this. But um, what, what we've been talking about so far is really that marriage is a, a spiritual uh um, arrangement, right? It's a, it, this is spiritual work. This is not merely legal. Um, in fact, really, uh, I would consider the idea of legal marriage, you know, within the eyes of the state being secondary to yeah, being married before the eyes of God. Right. So, um, yeah. so all this talk about, I you used know, to, I used to say when I would do, um, you know, by the, however it goes, like by the power vested in me by the state of Ohio, I, I don't like, Wait a minute. Why am I saying that? You know, and th and that's sort of the, what like, even is Ohio in comparison to Yahweh, right? <laughs> right. Like merely a state. Is... I don't. I'm going to go with less paper. significant, Alex, for 500. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you, Lee. No, yeah, I think I, 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 I think that's so important. I think that's really important. And you know, um, not not saying that people who were who went down to the justice of the peace aren't married, but maybe aren't, <laughs> you know, they might be married in the eyes of the state, but have they really made well, a commitment are, before God? There, there it's are a different thing. Uh, and and I, I was thinking about this when you're talking, there are, there are always exceptions to the rule. I, I don't want to be hard and fast. Like if your childhood pastor is not still your, pa like, you know, you sure it's not a valid marriage. If this person doesn't do it or right. that, I, I don't think that's true at all. And, but I, but I think the, um, what ought to be the norm in, in, in this day and age where, where we can move across the country easily, right? Um, where we're mobile and we're meeting people that live 400 miles away and, and that, you know, they get married. And, um, and I understand all of that, that there's exceptions, but the norm should be you grew up in a church, you stay in that church, you get married by that pastor. He stays in the church too. He's not one of these guys at the top. But I think the hmm. average pastor length now is like 18 months or something like that. Yeah. Like he's, it's the same guy who's been, you know, that, that knew you when you were little and uh, will, will be there to, 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 you know, help you 10 years from now. Like, I think that's the normal pattern of what ought to happen. It's often not what happens. And so there are cases where, whatever happens or whatever the life looks like and you go to the justice of the peace it is what it is um yeah i, I just want to mention yeah. that like I, I don't want people to think that i'm like being really legalistic about that yeah i'm just thinking that's what the norm ought to be and, and we're not saying that if you did go to the justice of the peace that well you're not really married now so yeah, just right. whatever <laughs> right i did not tell somebody once that. Yeah, I, I did that's tell not a, a loophole. Uh, <laughs> that's not what we're saying. I did tell a couple one time. I forgot to sign your paperwork, so I hope you haven't consummated your marriage yet. <laughs> like when they got back from their honeymoon, I said that. <laughs> Sorry, I probably shouldn't even yeah. joke about that. Well, this is a family the, the real the real reason I bring up the the legal marriage part is that usually what happens when the government gets a hold of something, they turn it into something that is usually opposed to what it was intended to be. Um, I don't want to go on a government rant, so I'm just going to leave it there. But one of the ways I think that's happened with legal marriage, um, part of it, I think, is the prevalence of no-fault divorce um, yeah. proceedings that make it so easy to throw your wife away or throw your husband away. Um, but I, it's, I think the most pressing issue is uh, the way that the state, the, the national government, the states themselves, it started with states, became uh, the national issue, would be under gay marriage. Um, so being able to redefine what a marriage is altogether and then assign those those relationships a legal status as a marriage alongside God-ordained marriage between one man and one woman 
makes makes these issues incredibly muddy. So I guess my my other question on this is, you know, how do Christians how should we approach um, worldly co opting of God's good design, um, either in the instance of gay marriage, um, you know, the prevalence of of quick and easy no fault divorce. Uh, there, there's probably other issues too. Those are the ones that are foremost in my mind. But you know, how do how do Christians approach um, issues like these? You know, what happens when you get the invitation to, you know, your 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 niece's gay wedding, for instance, that kind of a thing. So, I, I would say this uh, to to just sort of answer the question with a blanket statement: There's no such thing as gay marriage, because right. the the government does not create merit the government wants to so the constitution the supreme court no no branch of government or uh, bureaucracy creates marriage um they're just interested in tax records <laughs> right <laughs> that's that's all they care about is tax records <laughs> and so yes. The, the the government is going to keep track of who's ma who you know they're they're going to keep track of unions for tax purposes so um it is it is the bible it is god speaking in his word even in genesis chapter one that establishes marriage and so marriage has to be defined by what god says not anybody else so um, so it is between one man and one woman. It's for until death do us part, right? It's for a lifetime. Um, that's what marriage is. Anything else is just not marriage. Now, the government calls these things marriage, or our society um, calls these other arrangements marriage. There's common law marriage and, and all these other things that, you know, gay marriage, so, so called. Um, uh, but that doesn't make it so. And so as Christians who hold God's word as the so sola scriptura, right, our highest authority, um, if God's word is our highest authority, then we have to we have to look to God's word before we looked at, at the Constitution or whatever. And so um, if, if God's word is our highest authority, then we don't we can't recognize those things. And because they are often a celebration um uh, we, th there's times when we will say, I cannot participate in this because it is c directly contrary to how God established it. So, so if you have, and uh, let's take the gay part out just for a second. There are marriages, husband and wife, um, or man and woman coming together in a marriage. Maybe it's the third for one and the fifth for another. Mm -hmm. that I might, I'm not going to perform, maybe, right? I mean, there's redemption and, and you know, First Corinthians 6, and such were some of you. So there's, there, there may be reasons why I would um, after a lot of counseling ahead of time. But uh, there are straight marriages that I would say, I, I cannot go and be a part of that celebration. So So this isn't even just simply against like it isn't homophobic, which some people will say it isn't. Th this is this is not this is disordered. And and the thing with gay marriage is that it is completely disordered and cannot be made like it, it cannot be ordered. And like that union has to that union, so-called union has to dissolve. But like it isn't real. So. Um, so, for example, uh, man and woman living together, then getting married, that that is a uh, not a disordered. It's disordered in that they're not married if they're living together, but they can be made right and still be a union, right? Mm -hmm. So so a, a couple starts coming to church, they both get saved, um, they've been living together, or they've been fornicating or whatever, right? And then they wanna they wanna make their relationship right in the eyes of the Lord, but still stay together. Uh, we, we could say, you know, without all the details, we can say that is a good and right thing. And we can celebrate that, right? We would, we would love to see a couple come to Christ and want to make their disordered relationship into a God honoring relationship. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, a, a gay couple cannot do that. It is disordered 
no matter what. You cannot make it ordered in, in God's in God's eyes. It it is a disordered um, union. And the same thing with a, an adulterous relationship. Um, it, you know, if if they if somebody came to the church and said, you know, I'm married to this other person, but I want to marry this person. No, that is disorder. That cannot be made order. You are mm -hmm. committing adultery. That cannot be made order. You have to repent of your sin. Going back to that really helpful phrase in the confession too, that marriage, the third, the third thing mentioned is the preventing of uncleanness. If you, yeah. if that, if that relationship began with uncleanness, right. uh, you know, in some of those situations, the, the, the same sex situation, the um, adultery situation, you cannot clean that. It has to break. Right. right. And so even, with the, on you. even with fornication, you can, you can, in all three cases, it needs to be repented of, right? Mm -hmm. Only two unbe are, are unmarried. Um, so the sin is fornication. Only that relationship can actually be made um, moral in mm -hmm. the eyes of God. That, that comes after repentance. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah. we're, we're talking about because it's one man grace. and one woman. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, the, the example that you gave Dana, where you have a, 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 somebody, a, a, a guy's married to a woman and it decides, well, I kind of like this other woman over here. So yeah. I want to marry her. That would be an example of a, a wedding. I don't feel like I could go to. Right. And there's yeah. not any amount of him saying, yeah, but this really feels right to me. I just think I was made to marry this, <laughs> lo and behold, younger uh, woman who, you know, who right. I like huh. the way she Funny looks. How that and works. This just feels natural and normal and proper to me. It's just in my DNA. Well, to some extent, there might be some truth to it. it just seems hardwired into you. I still <laughs> yeah. can't go to that wedding. <laughs> to always look for your, a new woman. The old man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, 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 that all may be true. And I'm not going to argue with you that, no, you don't feel that way. Right. But I can't go to that wedding. Because we as Christians at, at, who, who are trying to be faithful to the Bible and to the, the one who created marriage and gets to define it uh, are going to be restricted on what uh, ceremonies we're going to go to because going to it is affirming it. It just is. That's the purpose of, of that has been historically the purpose of inviting guests to the wedding come yes. and celebrate with us our special day that, I mean, it'll say it on the invitations every, like the world knows that. Um, it, it, you know, it, there's sort of a let's take obligation out of it for a minute, right? So there are some weddings that we feel obligated to go to, and I don't want to go and be a part of, you know, whatever. So maybe you shouldn't. Maybe that's a different rabbit trail to go on. But um, but but that idea of come and celebrate with us, like even the world, the invitations say that, even the world understands mm -hmm. that. And for somebody to have the guts to stand up and say. No, we can't do that for what I'm yeah. gay, straight, whatever, to be able to say we, we can't affirm that this is a good union. This is an ungodly union. Um, it could be a believer marrying an unbeliever, right? Mm -hmm. The Bible tells yeah. very clearly says, and they might be, you know, pure and, and not, not act, you know, not sexually active in any way. And, and, but if one is an, a believer and one is an unbeliever, I don't think we can go. I think where it gets sticky, and maybe this is where the next question is, is what if it's your own kid, right? Or yeah. a relative. That's where it gets sticky. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was the, the, the next distinction we need to make is uh, we'll keep using this guy, you know, Mr. X, whoever this is, who left his <laughs> wife for the for the younger younger woman. Yeah. That doesn't mean I can't have him over for a barbecue on 4th of July. R like right. this isn't us saying, well, if you're Christians and somebody has ever committed some sexual sin, then, then don't ever eat with sinners. Why would we ever want to do that? Who, who would have done that as a Christian, right? We're not <laughs> well, saying that. We're saying and, that there is something unique about a wedding ceremony that isn't the same thing as 
having somebody over for a cookout or uh, you know, or a birthday party or or things like that. Paul makes that very clear in First Corinthians chapter six. He, yeah. you know, he says, "I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people." So this is exactly what we're talking about. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy <laughs> swindlers or idolaters. So it's even more than just sexually immoral. Um, since then, you need to go out of the world. And, and he says, he says, but now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed and he lists some more sins. So he, clearly he's talking about those within the church, right? Those who are, who are claiming to be Christians and are acting out in this way. That's where church discipline is so important. If, if there are people in the church who are um, sexually immoral and they're still in the church, I mean, in chapter, this is right in chapter five of first Corinthians, he says, get them out like a little, that's the, the phrase, the little leaven leavens the whole lump. You've got to get them out. If they're not going to repent. They've got to be removed mm -hmm. for the sake of the name of, of Jesus Christ, the purity of the church. And so uh, there, there's some, some big um, uh, sort of weighty matters for elders to deal with in that. And we have to deal with that um, in, in, as far as like, going and having a barbecue with your neighbor who lives with his girlfriend that you know it doesn't even like is not you're you're trying to you're trying to witness to him you're trying to be a good neighbor that's what jesus did that's not what paul is talking about there paul is saying i'm talking about people in the church people who who bear the name brother and yet live like the world anyway sorry steve go ahead no that that i think that's a really important distinction that we want to be clear about that the the guy who says, I demand that you regard me as a faithful brother in Christ, mm -hmm. and I want to live with my girlfriend or marry my boyfriend or whatever it is, you know, we, we filled in all these examples. Leave my wife for another woman, whatever it is. Right. The church can't. You think about the potential damage if you're a young person growing up in a church that doesn't seem to be bothered by a guy who left his wife and is now sitting in church with his new younger girlfriend. Nobody says anything. Yeah. Nothing happens. Like, and his ex-wife weeping in the back row. Right. And his ex-wife right. is, uh, in the yeah. I mean, think about the damage that that does. And what are we, what would we be as church leaders communicating to every, every little kid, every teenager, everyone about, the significance of this and what it means to be a Christian, you know, that's a, there's a reason why Paul is so throw him out, throw him out now. Yeah. And it, and it's, it's so that he might be redeemed, but he's pretty emphatic. Like a, the immediate response is this is a huge problem. This is going to damage the church. You've got to take action, swift and sure action immediately. Yeah. yeah. And, and being made to celebrate, those things uh i think about the there's that quote from solzhenitsyn live not by lies it comes to my mind a lot um just in our general world we live in where um there's all there seems to be an expectation for people to go ahead and assent to things that are lies um and believe them and i think this is this would be an, uh, an instance of that where you know if you were to go to that wedding um for whatever reason I'm not going to participate in a lie and call this a marriage. Uh, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to lie and say that I celebrate you when I actually don't. And I have a good reason not to. Um, and if I know a lot of people will use this, I'll call it, I'll call it an excuse uh, or, or a rationality that um, if I don't go to the wedding, then I will lose my relationship with this relative forever. Um, you know, <laughs> typically, uh, you know, if you've been if you've been playing with with that lost relative um, it, caught up in whatever sin that he or she's caught up in, uh, if you've been playing with them about the gospel, you know, <laughs> your your relationship is probably a bit tenuous anyway. Um, but if you've shown them if you, you've shown them the truth, you've you've preached the gospel to them over the years as as that person has grown up or you've spent time together, but you've shown them love and care as a person. Uh, that you've you've shown you're invested in in their well-being, want to see them blessed, meaning <laughs> repent of your sins and believe in Christ ultimately. Um, and not going to that wedding completely severs that relationship. 
you might not have the relationship that you thought you had. Um, and if, if you've taken those opportunities up to that point and Providence takes away future opportunities, then you just have to pray for that person, but you still have to hold to the convictions that you should hold to as, as a believer in Christ yourself and not, not do something less than that in order to maintain a connection for further opportunities to evangelize that person because you've then compromised those very convictions. Yeah, I think, I think I would just, from a pastoral standpoint, I, I think, um, so I, I don't know how to say this without bringing up the hot, the hot take. So Alistair Begg, right, was, was in the news recently about this because of some advice that he gave. And I, I went back just this morning, I, I found it somehow, and um, listened to what he had to say. And um, I disagree with his final conclusion. His conclusion was it was a transgender wedding. And his final conclusion was go and, and even buy a gift. But he really qualified. I agreed with everything except for that final point. And I even understand why he said what he said. So, so here's what I'm going to say is um, I want to be careful about these are re when it comes to like your children, um, people close to you. Like if it's a buddy at work, like I, I'm sorry, but yeah. I'm just not going to that. If it's, you know, some distant relative, like I'm just not going. But if when it's your own kid or niece or something like that, and it gets really, really difficult to make, the, especially when it's your own child. I'm just going to, especially when it's your own kid. I, what, what, it's just so hard to, to make that call. I'm going to say, I would not go. I would advise you not to go, but I'm going to love you even if you do. And, um, you know, let, so, so for example, I wouldn't necessarily put someone, I wouldn't put somebody under church discipline because they went to their son's transgender wedding. <laughs> right. I, I would, we wouldn't even, the church wouldn't even like, we're not going to have a big deal about it. Well, it wouldn't be here, <laughs> but yeah, right. we're not going to make a big deal about it, but I'm going to walk with that person through that. I want them to know whether it's gay, whatever their disordered, you know, their, their son or daughter and, and their whole life is a mess and it's disordered. And I, I see, because I know we have them in our church, I see people who are broken, uh, just heartbroken over their children, over their, or their siblings, whatever, over the sin of people in their family. And they want so badly to not sever the relationship so that they can have some kind of relationship with them. I get it. I understand. I'm going to make like, um, I've got this in my family. I'll just say that I've got this in my extended family and would not go. Um, I, I, there's there's marriages that people have approached me before not gay marriages but you know heterosexual unions that i have said no i'm not going to do um and and, and uh others that we've not been to but i understand how hard it is and i just want to acknowledge that it's a really difficult decision and if you make a decision i think you should not go i want to be clear about that i think you should not go but if you do we're still going to be here to walk with you through this. I, I think it's important to say, especially in this day and age, especially when things get so black and white, so fiery online and all of that, like real life is, these are hard things to walk through and you have to hold fast. Also, I want to acknowledge that some, and I think this is where you were, what you were saying, Lee, often people who are orthodox in their belief one of the reasons that we're in this place where we are now where it's becoming so popular to be gay or to like for christians to like gay christian and all of that has mm -hmm. become such a thing is because people who have historically been orthodox in what they believe um somebody close to them comes out of the closet somebody that they love dearly and then they compromise for that person and then they start, well, I love my son or my daughter. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to give an inch on this bit of doctrine. You know, it, when it becomes personal and real, it's harder to, to hold fast to the truth. So I want to encourage you to hold fast to the truth. I would encourage people not to go to those things, the, the weddings. Um, 
not to be a, a witness or a party to the celebration, uh, but also I understand, and we're gonna we're gonna walk with you through it. Um, yeah, I I think we should be clear that we, I think we would all say, our our counsel would be do not go to the wedding, but that doesn't mean and also call them up and say you can't come to Thanksgiving. <laughs> right, right. Like yeah. we're not saying that. As a matter of fact, we 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 want to have uh, engage people who are lost and you're not going to do that if you never are in the same room with that so so we're not saying you have to tell your son or daughter you can't come to thanksgiving you can't come to christmas you'll never set foot in my home again that is not what we're saying as a matter of fact we would say the opposite of that of that they're, they're not on the you know trespass warning list on, on your house now because they've done this that that's not what we're trying to communicate to people either yeah and, and and these are all really especially when it becomes very personal they're really hard decisions to make it's easy there when times, it's a a stranger or it's just a theoretical discussion yeah and, and there are times when you might say to you know a, a relative you can't come to thanksgiving like there are times when you might <laughs> You, sure. You know, we're, we're, I want to be clear about that too. It's not just yeah, invite and invite all your gay friends. I mean, th there are times right. when you might like say no because of your because of your sinful lifestyle, you can't come to this. Um, there are times when you might need to say that. That becomes very personal, like for each case type of issue, right? So we're. I want to be. I also want to be clear. We're not just speaking in generalities. It's hard to do that. Right. Um, that that you know. Yes, you want them to. You want them to feel safe coming to you. You want your kid. I, I'm going to talk about kids, right? You want your kids to be able to come back. It's the it's the the prodigal son, the father standing out on the, uh, you know, on the front porch waiting every day for the son to come back, and then he goes running out there, and it, you want your kid to be to be able to come back, um, and and so you pray for their repentance and and. Uh, uh, so there, there's a, you know, you always have a seat at my table. I, I said to my kids, there's nothing that you can do that will make you me not love you. There's nothing that you can do that will make me like disown you or not want to be your dad anymore, you know, to cut you off. There are times when we may need to cut off our kids from, from one thing or another in one way or another. Um, but, but I'm always going to be your father, right? Like I'm always going to be I'm always going to be dad. And, and so you always have a place you can come back. It may just be you and me. It may not be at a big family birthday party, yeah. um, but it, but it could be, you know, so anyway, th there's lots of different, we could throw all kinds of scenarios out there where you might or might not. And, it, and it is, it's complicated. Um, and it, when it becomes very personal, it becomes very complicated. Oh yeah. Well, I, I don't have much more to add. I don't have any more uh, questions. I think we've we've hit the uh, the topics I wanted to talk about. Um, before we ascend the library ladder, any any final summary comments on on these issues of marriage and and weddings and what's right before God? I guess the the one last thing I would just throw in there is that we 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 touched on this a little bit, but the idea that. Uh, what a government makes legal doesn't necessarily make it so. I mean, we can we can look back in history and see things that were legal that now we go, oh, that wasn't, no, <laughs> that, that was not true. And we can look around the world today at, at uh, nation states that have legalized things with marriage that even a lot of people here who would disagree with us on the, some of these issues would go, no, that's not that's not right. So <laughs> right. So we want to we 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 want to live peaceful, quiet lives uh, with with it, our government, but we're not going to. We want to be thoughtful Christians, and and just because something got legalized doesn't now mean it's well. I guess that's it. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. First Corinthians six eleven, and such were some of you but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the spirit of our God. 
I think it's just an important thing to remember when we're dealing with sinners, <laughs> you know, and such were some of you. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, what, uh, what books do we have to recommend gentlemen, Steve, you want to go first? Sure. I'll go first. Um, apparently I am on a Samuel Renahan kick. So, uh, <laughs> the mystery of Christ, his covenant and his kingdom. Whoop, whoop. I don't know if you can see it. There you go. Uh, Really good. Highly recommend. You want to do a little uh, uh, survey through uh, the covenants of the Bible. Great book. It's not super long. Highly recommend it. Check it out. I have one. Uh, and and I, I'm worried now, now that I hear Steve talking, I'm worried that maybe Steve, I'm not worried, but maybe Steve already recommended this maybe uh -oh. weeks and weeks ago. Podcasts and podcasts ago, but it is a gospel primer by Milton Vincent. Did you recommend it once? I think yes. maybe, but, but okay, so this I, is I a remember. double recommendation. So read it twice, read this everybody. Book. <laughs> yeah. It's short. You can read it again. It's super yeah. short. It's super short. It's it's super easy to read. This is a, a, a gospel primer for Christians learning to see the glories of God's love. Um, I highly recommend this. Steve recommends it. Yes. Um Someday in the next in the next couple of months, Lee will recommend it. Uh, this, it is, <laughs> that is not the last time we will. <laughs> <laughs> it will it will definitely make the rounds. <laughs> um, my recommend my recommendation today is a uh, a gospel primer. No, okay. <laughs> 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 no, I uh, not I I didn't actually pick this specifically because of uh, our topic today, but this is overcoming sin and temptation which is a, an, it's actually a pretty thick, it's an omnibus volume done by Crossway. It's, it's by John Owen, um, but they did, you know, modernize the language a little bit because John Owen is famously difficult to read. Uh, but it contains uh, of the mortification of sin in believers, of temptation, the nature and power of it, and his work indwelling sin. Um, these are three very good works on uh, these particular issues. Um, Owen is just, one of the greats. Um, highly recommend anything that he writes, but especially if people have done the work to make him as accessible as possible, uh, definitely worth picking up. So Overcoming Sin and Temptation uh, by John Owen. Uh, this is a Crossway volume, uh, three of his works put together. Excellent. Anything else, gentlemen? I think what we need is a blessing. <laughs> Bless us, Lee. <laughs> Let's have it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.